Welcome to the SBP podcast, the voice of mobile film. This is episode 43, and I'm your host, Susie Botello. It's so good to be back. Our show had a gap, and the holidays were really very busy on our end. Uh, We've been working on what is referred to as the Oscars of mobile film. Last year, we launched the Global Mobile Film Awards as an online award ceremony. It's not a film festival. Anyways, uh, member film festivals around the world apply for a membership, and they are then offered to nominate award winners from their film festivals to receive the best of the best awards. And only films that have received awards qualify to be nominated. By the way, This membership is for all film festivals, not just mobile and smartphone film festivals, which are pretty much almost the same thing. The criteria is that nominees must have been shot with films with smartphones and won official awards. Our guest is Anthony Montes. He travels around the world as an acting coach and has spent 40 plus years in the film and theater industries. He has been promoting mobile filmmaking to his students for some time now, actually, and we met him through one of our mobile filmmakers that we interviewed in episode 12, Blake Worrell. Now, you may wish to listen to that podcast, perhaps after this one, though, because, uh, well, actually, why don't you just add it to your queue so you don't forget? It's a very insightful conversation about the art of cinematography and using smartphones to make films. And I really think you'll enjoy it. I know I really enjoyed that podcast as well. Um, so we had a deadline for the International Mobile Film Festival, which ended on November 19th. And that also kept us busy. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, we had a show online for the Global Mobile Film Awards, which included all the films that were nominated by the member film festivals this year. And oh my God, The films were awesome. Uh, They each fell into categories like, well, let me just list them. Best film, best director, best cinematography, best comedy, best visual effects, and best experimental. Now, although the show ended last night, you may have seen the films because we were online since uh, November 28th, actually. And the award ceremony, which will announce the winners is taking place online at 7 o'clock p.m. Pacific Standard Time on December 10th. So you can watch it on, I'm just going to give you the link really quick, www.gmfawards.com. That's www.gmfawards.com. Now, you know what? Actually, I'm going to name the nominees. Because I'm going to give all the nominees a shout out. They deserve a huge thank you from the entire mobile filmmaking community. Because their films will inspire more people to make better films using their smartphones. Nominations by the International Mobile Film Festival in San Diego, Focus by Brian Hennings, and The Actor by Norell Nash. Um, The nominations by Cinephone Smartphone Film Festival in Barcelona were She Rose by Mawina Wadzika, Promise by Ivan Sosnin, Sonatina by Hoi Wong, Dulcinea by Francisco Lidon, Yes, No by Matteo Tibiletti. Nominations by SF3 Smartphone Flickfest in Sydney were She Rose by Mawina Wadzika, if that name sounds familiar, is because she received two nominations from this uh, for this film, uh, one from Cinephone and one from SF3. Back to the nominations by SF3, 
the film Forgive Me by Calum Pritchard, I Hate It by Ethan Doe, Restoration by Ra Sharman, and Upend by Blake Worrell. Name sounds familiar. We just talked about him a minute ago. Uh, 97 Seconds by Ren Thackham. And I want to say congratulations to all of you. Yay! All right. Uh, so, <laughs> by the way, uh, two of these film festivals that um, we didn't mention are the brand new member Mobile Filmmaker International Film Festival in Russia and Heartland Films Indie Shorts International Film Festival, which is one of our founding members uh, for GMFA. And they are both accepting film submissions right now, like literally. So go to the website and check out all the member film festivals www.globalmobilefilmawards.com Now, we caught up with Anthony Montes in San Francisco last night, and he's our guest. I think you will find our conversation really interesting. He has an event coming up in a few days, which we're going to talk about um, in, in this podcast and if you happen to be in L.A. or near Hollywood, go and check it out. Go, Just go see it. The event is filling up, and it's free. But make sure you RSVP so that you get a seat. Again, it's free, so you'll want to get a seat. It's going to fill up. Uh, www.themontesmethod.com is his website. Themontesmethod.com. And you can also catch him on Facebook uh, at Montes Method, and it's that simple. Uh, that's at Montes, M-O-N-T-E-S, Method. All right, let's go talk to Anthony now. Hey, Anthony, how are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm pretty good. Uh, we're not too far away from each other. Uh, I'm in San Diego and you're in San Francisco, right? Yeah, I live in uh, L.A., but I come up uh, Monday through Wednesday and I teach in San Francisco. You do travel a lot. Yes. Uh, <laughs> um, for our listeners, I want to introduce you to Anthony Montes. Uh, he's been in the theater and in the film industry for over 40 years now, right? Um, well, since 19, yeah, I guess it is. Yeah. You know, it was so in it in 1976, so. Wow. And, uh, and you, and then, but you've been acting on your website. It says you've been, you've been, uh, an acting coach for over 30 years. Correct. Yeah. Um, and you have, uh, a reputation, uh, for being an acting coach, and you've been, you work from LA to New York to Berlin to Dubai and many places in between uh, where you teach. Um, and you teach the Montes method acting. Uh, yes. And you've been promoting the use of iPhones for filmmaking, which is probably where where listeners are wondering why we're, we're speaking, even though you are a very interesting and um, and, you know, it's, it's really an honor to speak with you today. So thank you for, for being a part of the podcast, Anthony. Oh, it's my pleasure. So I wanted to, I wanted to share really quick first a little, little tiny little story of how you and I met, because I don't know if you realize this, but uh, last year, uh, almost a year ago, I, sh I should say, I was recording a podcast with Blake Worrell, who is a good friend of yours, when he was in Berlin. And uh, you had just arrived where he was because you were going to do a live recording on Facebook about acting. 
And um, it was very late here in San Diego. I remember that. But I stayed up to to watch it. I was really inspired by by your entire presentation that you gave. Um, and that's how that's how we met. Well, that's really cool. I mean, it was really um, Blake uh, who instigated that whole thing. And, and Blake is really the one behind the Montez method. Oh, well, we'll definitely have to talk about that. This is about you, but we'll definitely have to talk about that uh, and how Blake inspired you to do that or, you know, brought that whole thing up. That was actually one of my questions was, um, you know, was about that specifically, how how you began to even introduce the iPhone filmmaking in your in your workshops and your classes. But before we go there, Anthony, I would really love for you to share with our listeners a little bit about you and who you are. Who is Anthony Montes and how did you become to work in the film industry? Well, being an actor is something I was aware I wanted to do uh, at five years old. Um, I would watch movies and I would act out the parts of uh, Cagney and Brando and the Dead End Kids, and Jerry Lewis. Um, I'm the oldest of five, so I'd have my, my brother and three sisters uh, do the roles with me, but I would do all the leads and they do the smaller parts. Um, but in the beginning, I wanted to be an actor because I wanted to be anybody but myself. Um, uh, so I thought it was a way of escaping. It wasn't until I got out of the Navy and really started pursuing acting, studying at HB Studios, um, that I found out that that's not what acting was. It was uh, not hiding behind a mask. It was uh, taking the mask off. Um, and I'm, I was very inspired by Al Pacino. Uh, so I wanted to know what he knew, and, then, and that's what led me to HB Studios originally. Um, and it, I've always been very passionate about it. Um, I loved acting and, and for many years, that's the way I saw myself as an actor, a struggling actor. And I love, uh, Van Gogh and I really discovered Van Gogh through his words, um, through Dear Theo first. Um, and I thought struggling was a part of it that you, you know, the more you were willing to struggle, the, uh, the greater the artist you were. Um, I don't believe that anymore. I don't think you have to struggle um, to do your art because then that's all you can bring to your art is the struggle and you don't know anything else and I surely didn't. Um, and then in 84 I moved to Los Angeles. Um, I studied at Playhouse West. I studied the Meisner Technique and I got to study a summer with Sandy which was life changing. From there, I went. Uh, I auditioned to the Actors Studio, and I became a working observer there. And I studied with Shelley Winters, and I was always in class. Um, I couldn't get enough of it. Uh, I think if you're an actor or an artist, you have to do something for your art every day. And back when I was beginning, you didn't have well cell phones for sure. You didn't have crowdfunding. You didn't have any of that. Um, and I quickly found out that a lot of the plays that I auditioned for were already cast and maybe they were looking for understudies. So in 87, I started my own group. I called it the Artist Theater Group. Artist, because that's what I aspired to be, theater, because I love theater and group, out of respect for the group theater. And over about a 12-year period with them, I put up 90 plays and I lost money on 89 plays. Wow. Yeah. So I was... I felt I was climbing the ladder artistically and creatively, but definitely digging a ditch for myself financially. Um, and then writing became a part of my teaching to empower the actor to not wait for those opportunities, to create your own opportunities through writing. Then um, through cell phones, a, a former student of mine, a uh, friend, Angela Blake, I think one of my talents is um, good at seeing things in people that maybe they didn't see in themselves. Like Angela, I saw a director in her and, and more and a producer. And then she took that on when she went to back to Sydney and started this smartphone film festival. 
Um, Blake I met in a workshop that a friend of mine set up in Berlin when I started traveling overseas. That's a whole <laughs> other conversation. But Blake really took it to heart, you know, creating your own opportunities, writing your own things. And he's very good at um, learning from tutorials. He's all self-taught. So I guess there comes a time when the teacher becomes a student, and that's what happened with Blake and I. Um, he kept, because what I was teaching was not just Meisner, that was the foundation, but it was a blend of Meisner and Strasberg and Chekhov and Adler and myself, things uh, that I would use. And depending on the student's needs, I can adjust it to each student individually in a class. And who are they to, you know, for listeners that don't know who those names are? Well, like I said, in, in, when I called my group the Artist Theater Group, in around 1930s, the, the, the group theater was founded by a man named Harold Clerman, Lee Strasberg, and a woman named Cheryl Crawford. Uh, the Moscow Art Theater had been in New York, run by Konstantin Stanislavski, and these actors were blown away by what they saw. Nobody on stage seemed to be acting. From the lead role to the person with one line, everyone seemed to be real. So it was a different approach to acting. It was, now we were going to act from the inside out, from the emotional life out, as opposed to from the, the hair, the makeup, the wardrobe, and indicate feelings. No longer were we going to do that. <clears throat> We'd really feel what we felt. And I guess on the forefront of that were people like, well, well, the teachers that came out of that group of about 30 actors was Sandy Meisner, uh, Bobby Lewis, Stella Radler, and Lee Strasberg. And initially, they were taking the teachings of Stanislavski and making it their own. Um, Strasberg believed in affected memory, which meant you drew from real situations in your life, which Stanislavski used to use as well, but then he abandoned it. Um, a lot of actors didn't want to tear off the, that scab on that wound for their acting. Meisner was about using the imagination, same with Stellar. So they had different approaches to achieve living truthfully under the imaginary circumstances on stage or in front of the camera. So what I've done is I've drawn what's worked for me or what I personally found valuable, and that's what I share along with um, exercises that I've developed over the, well, the 30 years I've been teaching. You know, um, I, uh, I took acting, actually, myself, which is something I did since I was a little kid. Um, I grew up also in the military uh, myself. And um, one of the things that, um, that you said earlier was about the escape you know, the feeling of escaping yourself and you could go into being whoever you wanted to be, basically. Um, and um, I remember uh, my father was also a photographer and I wanted, I watched him behind a camera all the time. And I started handling a camera when I was around seven years old. And the one thing that I loved was also another sense of escape because you go behind the lens and everything you see, uh, even if it is just a photograph, um, is, is like your own world. It's limited. It's, it's kind of like tunnel vision, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, and it is another form of escaping the real world. Well, all of a sudden, it's whatever you create, um, depending on the angles that you're shooting from. I remember my father getting up on top of things or getting really low down on the ground and going from here to there to capture shots of the same subjects, right? Well, um, and what you were talking about escaping, I just saw a similarity with that with a lot of artists, to be honest with you, um, where the artist goes into their zone to escape realism in a way, but it actually is also a form of expression of, you know, of what's inside at the same time, right? Well, I don't know anymore that they're escaping realism as much as they're creating a, a different reality. Mm -hmm. 
that's really what we're doing because you know you read the author's words if it's a play or if it's a screenplay and I look at it and where do I relate where where do I see myself in that and what character traits does this character have that are different than mine and then I have to find them within me and I am really creating a different reality it's as if this is my world you know this is who I'm in love with uh, this is what I have to do um, and our imagination is so strong I can kind of fake myself out and buy into it and believe that at least while I've prepared and while I'm doing that 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 is my reality. Yeah, that's true. Um, I've spoken to different actors in this podcast before. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, one of the things that um, I personally always suggest to different actors is instead of uh, waiting to be cast in a film, to just grab their phones and make their own films and cast themselves. And... Um, and so I wanted to I wanted to talk about that with you. I I had a really small brief experience acting in a short film before. I like being behind the camera. Mm-hmm. Uh but I would recommend almost every filmmaker to at least somehow experience that themselves if they can because it gives you uh it does really affect your perspective uh you know as a director and as a filmmaker. Um, and I was wondering if you could share with our listeners all the benefits to an actor to make films using uh, smartphones. Well, you know, especially today, an actor can't say, oh, I didn't get the part of There's no roles for me. If you're passionate, if this is what you want to do with your life, then, then you've got to create your own opportunities. Where I was doing it on stage uh, this was the ne- next evolution of it um, to film yourself, and the cameras are so good. Um, to to we have to learn to do the things we we cannot do, or if you really feel like you can't, then you got to find the person who can operate that camera. But you know where in the past you needed a reel to get an agent, right? So how did you? You put this reel together. You had to be cast in television shows and then assemble, uh, you know, your work. Now, because they want to see what you look like, what you sound like, um, so you come across as real. Now you can put together your own reel, shooting your uh, using your your cell phone, and you could tailor your reel for what you need. You know, they want to see you doing some comedy, being you know emotional, being uh, threatening. You know, you can create, shoot what you need, assemble the reel, and have it showcase your work. Um, and you can go further than that, than that. I mean, you don't have to wait for somebody to like your short, who's going to finance your short, to submit it to somebody, especially to uh, literary agents. It's very difficult to get a literary agent unless you know somebody in that agency. So rather than go through all of that, cut to the quick. And begin to make your own reel, begin, begin to make your own short film, be, begin to make your own feature film. Um, there's no excuses not to be working as an actor today. None. Um, and if, if you're a, a filmmaker starting out, then find people of like mind, crew for each other, and start making films. Make your mistakes um, and learn and grow from them. So... Once this technology became available, as I started traveling and in all my teaching, that's what I promote um, is to take your phone out of your pocket, learn how to do something besides checking your Facebook messages, <laughs> and, and, and if, if you're uh, an artist, then start creating your art. Um, and then I've seen... Uh, many of my students around the world and in the States start to do just that. And that's how Blake began uh, doing it too. Um, and, and others, like somebody sending something to your festival from one of my classes, never did anything before. And it's crude and he'll make his mistakes and he'll learn from them. And the next film he makes 
uh, will be more advanced than the one he just did. But it shouldn't even just be about the result. It's about taking that first step and beginning to create and learn from your mistakes. Well, and, you know, there are experienced actors uh, like uh, uh, let me see, uh, Sophia Coppola and Ben Affleck, um, just to name a couple of them, who have been in the industry for many years, but they have also decided to go behind the camera and direct uh, as well. And um, I think that acting can bring... Uh, something to directing and filmmaking, just having that background. What do you think? Well, in my, my class, the way I structured it, it's like a gym, right? So I have writers, directors, and actors, and I think each of us needs to step in the shoes of the other person, that the, that the director needs to know what an actor is going through, that an actor has to have respect for the written word, and each of us to step into each of these different disciplines to have a greater respect for one another and appreciation for the, what the other one does. So in my classes, I have people write, and the first time they hear their stuff, they're not reading it. They hear somebody else read it. And they just sit back as the writer. And they could tell somebody changed a word because then it changes the meaning, and them as an actor they pay more attention, they have more respect for the written word when they are working on scripts. A director gets more of an understanding of how to talk to an actor, um, what an actor goes through, and a greater respect for an actor. I taught in a, a pretty famous um, acting school, uh, the New York Film Academy, and there were, um, I knew they have a, a lot of um, foreign students, there were a lot of directors that learn what to do technically, but they don't know how to talk to their actors. They don't have enough. In fact, I started an acting class there for directors, but it was only like five classes. But even with those five classes, they had a greater respect for what the actor does and how to talk to them. Because they would just say, okay, I need you to go over here and cry. And they really wouldn't, you know, they, would, they would look at them like they were props. Um, not all, of course, but, but, but more so than not. So, and I saw a difference in their work um, when each of them had to be in the other person's shoes, it, just a, a greater respect. So, yeah. Yeah, I was going to say it, it, it would really help a lot with um, some people forget because there's so much in, in directing, um, which is why it's important to, to make sure, even if you have a minimal skeleton, a skeleton crew that you have the basics covered so you're not concerned with that because I think it really helps, you know, uh, as a director that you work with the story structure and the character development as well. Absolutely. Yeah, not just the visuals. Um, now, for the acting, the actor in front of a small camera as opposed to a big industrial camera, right? Some right. actors say that it's it's a more intimate experience. Do you think that's important, uh, you know, for an for an actor uh, with their audience to have in their performance to to have that sense of more intimacy? Yeah, and and I think that's why, um, we, we, you know, when I started out, we all did theater and and had a love for theater. And I know many actors see, you know, theater is ah. You know, it's just about doing films. Small equity wave of theater in like 50 seat theaters is the best training for an actor. Because you that's where you discover that you're enough. That's where you discover uh, about being intimate on stage and it translates to the camera. Because you're not projecting to 2,500 people. You don't have to do anything that's unnatural. And the same thing in front of the camera or, or, this, uh, or your, your cell phone. It allows you to be as intimate as you need to be. Um, yeah, you're yeah. performing to your audience directly that way, right? Yeah. It's like sitting in the first row. Whenever I go to theater, I like to sit in the first few row, rows. I want to see what's happening in the actor's eyes. I want to see if they're really feeling, you know, what, they, what, what the scene calls for. Um, and in, in front of the camera, uh, 
the phone, it, it just allows that, you know, allows you to be truthful, to be real. There's so much, um, you know, like for me, way back when I when I started this in, in 2009, there really were very few people, if any, really, that were taking it seriously to produce actual films. There was a lot of, um, well, m- maybe not even so much, but uh, there were a few people that were experimenting with it. And back then, I mean, we're still talking cell phones for the most part, you know, um, just a few pixels on the cameras. Um, and people didn't have the accessories and the apps and everything that they have now. But now, here we are, we're looking at 4K uh, on their phone, the the amazing uh, progress that a camera has made on the phone. But yet what I see more, I don't know if you do too, is a lot of chatter about the gear. Got to have lenses, got to have gimbals, got to have specific apps, got to have this and got to have that. And I think we go back to, you know, missing on the story and the characters that make the story uh, to make really good films. It's it's almost strange to me because the cameras are better. Like you, you almost feel like you should need less than that, right? <laughs> yeah, well, I think... The, the first thing is to, you know, a lot of people can't afford like those bigger rigs that they have. Yeah. Um, so that could be the excuse not to do anything. Uh, I think first learn the basics with your camera uh, raw, you know, what, you know, a lack of money just forces you to be creative in different ways. So if you can make a, 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 a good film with your phone, as is, you know, I think you have to earn, earn the right to invest more in your camera, you know, make sure it's not going to be one of these things. I want to play electric guitar and you buy the amp and you buy the guitar and it's fun for a week and then you never pick it up again. Right. You know, so don't go spending all that money till you know that this is your passion, but get, I mean, get to learn whatever phone you have and make your film the best way you can with that first and then add on as 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 you need to tell the story and and do stories that favor your phone the way it is so you're not going to do Lawrence of Arabia with just your phone but you, can, but you can definitely do Locke with your phone the Tom Hardy film where he's just in his car yeah you know I mean so that's why I say there's no reason to not work you you look around you and say what do I have available to me uh, my friend has this diner, so maybe you write a scene that takes place in a diner, and you shoot that. And if you have nobody, you, you, you do what he did. Not that he didn't have anybody, but something like Locke or, uh, or um, there's many films that they it's one location, you know? So see who you have around you, see what you have available, but learn how to use that phone as it is, and then add on uh, as you need. And the more you do, the more you learn. And the more you learn, the more, I mean, it comes with experience, you know. Um, with and it comes better, with, yeah. yeah, and it, it will come with, I remember for the fun of it, I took a uh, photography class at Valley College. And that was great. For those 15 weeks, you're in the dark room. And I remember I, I didn't look at life the same. I looked at it through the lens. I, as I was walking, things would catch my eye differently. I said, oh, my God. That would make a that would look great from this angle in black and white. I think it's the same thing when you get into the world of making your own films. All of a sudden, it's like, oh, that would be that'd be great to just shoot it from that angle, or just I love what's happening over here, you know. But you got to you got to get into that world. It's true, and and you know, um, I think you know, time rolls. Wh- whether you're practicing or whether you're just playing around or whether you're focused and doing something seriously, and you could, uh, with all the new stuff coming out and all the new phones constantly coming out, I mean, if you have the money and that's what you want to do, you'll never, there, there's no ends to the means in a way. But almost on the flip side of that, it keeps people from actually focusing on, you know what, I'm just going to create an entire story 
in a film using, you know, my phone and stop just shooting clips and 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 testing this gear and the other because meanwhile the the time is just going by, you right. know. Um, and, and what's with yeah. the with with the, the cell phone too? It's it's a lot easier to steal shots, you know. Yeah. Um, because it's just a a cell phone. It's a great device uh, for making documentaries. Oh, I know. Those are my favorite. I love documentaries. Um, and you know, the other thing about documentaries too is that you know, I I wor- I've worked uh, with or and you know, organizations and, and clients who are, you know, creating promotional documentaries and, and things like that. And, um, like say for nonprofits where they're, uh, interviewing people in the community who are hurting in some way and they're sharing their stories in order to get funding and, and so forth, uh, to help those people. And for me, I always thought, wouldn't it be great if those people could share their own stories from their own perspective, um, as opposed to having us going there to interview them and share them that way? And now they can. Yeah, and it it just makes our world all the smaller. That's you true. Know, between this and, and YouTube, it's like, you know, you can be transported to another world instantly with not a lot of expense. And it and it is truly for me, anyways. It's truly about the story because I I really, down in my heart, believe that stories are what connects us. Well, absolutely. Well, I see that with my teaching around the world. I mean that we are basically all the same. So. Yeah, definitely. And I, yeah, and I've gone from, you know, Johannesburg to Istanbul to Mumbai, Dubai, Paris. Uh, Berlin, Mexico City, and you know I've been to thirteen countries in the last four years. I'd never been to before. So yeah, in and them as well, I've got them <laughs> on their phones making movies. It's but it's true. empowering too, because now you don't feel like you are a victim of the system. Now you don't feel like I've got to wait for somebody to give me permission to act. You know, if you're truly passionate about it, then get on stage or get your, your, your phone out of your pocket and do what you say you want to do. Yeah, you know, that's that's another part of it uh, when it comes to the story aspect of this that, uh, you know, back in the caveman days, right, uh, you know, it's like, you know, they were painting drawings on the wall to express, you know, to share their stories back then. And I think, you know, the technology when, when cameras were invented and, and even with writing and writing books, because, you know, not everybody could write, but it's always been um, a group of people in society who had that power to, to to take over the stories. I mean, we can all share stories, you know, like like today, we'll we'll go to a coffee shop and share stories with complete strangers and so forth. But the, the real power of storytelling has been through a specific group of people, I think, um, throughout our history. And I think we're going through this evolution now between the internet and social media and the smartphone with the camera that, that we are in, we have a lot more power that, than we realize to share our stories now. And we can become a part of that group. Absolutely. We have the power to, entertain but we also have the power to to say things about the things we want to say something about to record history as it's happening to you know with the whole thing with Khashoggi I don't know if it was true that um they got the tape off of his cell phone wow what was going on so I mean we you know how many times have we seen unfortunate events where somebody happened to have their cell phone and filmed it you know, yeah. Uh, so we we are definitely um, have the ability to document history to keep this, you know, pictorial image of our world around us. I mean, you, it'd be a cool thing. You know, I do a thing every morning. Um, first thing I do when I wake up is I write a note to myself. Um, if I wasn't doing it, if I was in this generation, maybe I would just do a, uh, and not that I couldn't do it now, but um, to do a video to myself. You know, just 
what's happening today or where am I today or, you know. Um, I, uh, that reminds me of uh, I Am Legend uh, with uh, Will Smith when he was all alone in the in the world there and uh, or at least in New York, right? And he was uh, doing like a video journal every day, every morning. I mean, that, you know, I always like the movies of the 70s that are just about the human condition. So these are interesting. You know, it's interesting to, to, to peek behind the curtain and, and see people's lives, and, you know, in, in the films that I like. And, um, well, the, the cell phone just makes it so much easier and, and takes away any excuses about not doing anything. Yeah, I, I I really really think uh, that we're it we're un, we're lucky to be alive right now and experiencing. There's so much crap, quite honestly, <laughs> that's going on. But on the flip side, we're in, we're living in this time when things really are. Uh, we're going through a, an evolution uh, time. There, this is the first time in the in the whole history of the Earth. Like, I remember back, well, I don't remember because I wasn't there, but um, I remember talking about this, uh, sticks and stones, right? And those were our tools back in the day for, for, you know, a very long time. You could go all around the earth and everybody was using the same tools, sticks and stones. And then we started inventing things, you know, and metals and, and machines and things like that. And now we are back in that time again when we're all using that same tool everywhere you go around the world everybody has a smartphone yeah you know so i i really do believe we're going through something uh pretty major and probably more important to share these stories huh <laughs> uh, absolutely i think just what's with what is happening in this world today i mean imagine if you had it during the vietnam you know uh, the things, the war probably would have been over quicker, yeah. you know, uh, you know, sending home the reality of what's going on. Um, so I think this period could be a period like in, this, in we had great movies come out of the 60s, great music come out of the 60s. You know, we had something to say. Now everybody could say what they want to say. Uh because they, they're carrying around the equipment in their pocket. Yeah, it really is empowering. Um, yeah. Are you still performing by chance? Yeah. I. Um, if, if any of my students would hear you ask me that question and me say, yeah, I'm performing, they would say, because I always tell them we're not performing. We're living truthfully under the imaginary circumstances. And I'm not looking to perform. I'm looking to be. Aww. But I am going to be on stage um this coming Friday, Saturday, and Sunday uh, at the Whitmore Theater, Whitmore uh, Lindley Theater in North Hollywood, um, doing a one-man show that I wrote. And that's, um, where is that? That's December 8th, right? December 7th, 7th. and 8th, 8 o'clock, December 9th at 3 o'clock. And the Whitmore, Whitmore Lindley Theater is at 11006 Magnolia Boulevard. That whole area has become a real uh, theater uh, district, and um, it's uh, it's no two shows will be the same. I mean, I did it once before at um, James Franco's Studio Four, where I taught, and I did it for six nights, and I had people who came all six nights because the show was different. Hmm. It begins and ends the same, but the whole middle is different night after night, and it, it deals with the topic of suicide. So I'll have a a Q and A afterwards to to start a dialogue about that. Um, what um what got you? You know, for, uh, I want to share with our listeners um, that we're going to share to look into the notes because we're going to share the information about these events so that they can go if they happen to be, you know, in the area. Um, yeah. You were talking about um, suicide, um, mm -hmm. and I wanted to ask you. Because you know, I follow you on Facebook, and I and I see that you're you you. It was pretty recent that you decided to help people through. You know, was it a personal experience, or what got you? Well, when I was, you know, um, 
I, I think I suffered from depression. I told you in the beginning, uh, at five, I wanted to be an actor because I wanted to be anybody but myself. Um, so I had a, a rough uh, upbringing. Um, and at 27, I had had enough and um, I jumped in front of a train in, uh, in uh, Queens on the elevated. As soon as I hit the tracks, I thought of my mother and knew I couldn't do that to her. <clears throat> and I forgot which where the third rail was and I had no time to think and I jumped to the left and the train clipped me and my left arm fractured my arm. I'm very lucky. Um, so in the beginning, nobody, no, there was nobody who knew me that would ever thought that would be me. I was the funny guy, I was the class clown. And for years I said I slipped. There's no way I was gonna tell anybody the truth. And then one day I had a friend who was in rehab and me, my brother, and another friend were there as a support group, and they were talking about suicide. And I felt like such a phony, um, because they looked at us who came from the outside like we had it all together. And that's when I first admitted that um, it wasn't an accident that I had tried to kill myself, um, which shocked my brother, my poor brother, and uh, my friends. Um, so it's always been a subject that's been near and dear to me. Um, whenever I hear of a suicide, it, you know, it makes me realize again, how lucky I am and how much pain there is out there. So some of my first, uh, dealings with the topic, I, when Robin Williams died, I started a smile campaign on uh, Facebook. Um, and I wasn't even such a, Robin Williams wasn't like my Pacino. I, Admi uh, I looked up for, to him, um, uh, but that scared me because I thought once you had children, that took that option off the table. And he was a guy that seemingly has it all, and then he did that. So I started a smile campaign where I would just ask people to sing Smile by Charlie Chaplin in uh, memory of um, Robin Williams. So I, I did that. I wrote a, a, a play called Subway Suicide. And from that play, we did a, um, a Indiegogo campaign. Some mother in Texas saw the video and contacted us and her 13 year old daughter had tried to kill herself. She had cut her wrist and was the same age as my son at the time. She showed her daughter the video and her daughter thought that me and Sierra were the only people that she would be able to understand that, that she could relate to. So we became mentors to this this kid, and I wrote a part for her in my film. I adapted um, Subway Suicide into The Last Train. I wrote a part for her, so she's in the movie. But that shows you the power of um, video. Um, it wasn't shot with a smartphone, but it could have been shot with a smartphone. But the point is, somebody saw it that didn't know us, reached out, and got help. Um, so I saw the power of film with that subject, you'd be able to reach more people with, and now my one man show, which deals with the same subject. Um, so it's different from night to night. It's, it, it starts with me. Uh, I hear the train and I jump, but I end up in this otherworldly place and I have a bingo wheel that has 75 chapters from my life and the audience will spin it and pull a chapter. And I have to explain why I did what I did. And at the end, they're the deciders, and they'll decide if I go back and complete my mission on Earth or if I join them. So it's kind of interactive. There's a possible 75 stories, and on any given night, I probably get through 10 to 13 and then start a dialogue about it. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I, I don't mind being a, a face for what, you know, someone who attempted suicide look, looks like. I mean, I'm lucky that was in July 4th, 1983, so... I've had an extra 35 years. Um, so, yeah, well, it's a very, it's a very difficult subject. Um, uh, and power to you too, um, to do that and be willing to, to be out there to face that through other people, um, like that. Do you, when you do this performance, do you get a lot of people, um, who, who talk to you, uh, yeah you know, even after the performance? 
Yeah, that's how. That's why I, I, I now uh, included the uh, Q and A at the end, because when it was over, I never had that experience on stage, where I came back out after you know going to the dressing room, and almost everybody's still sitting there, and some of them want to thank me, and they think it's courageous that I um, shared my story. I don't. I don't see myself as being courageous for doing that. Um, they want to share their own stories. I've heard uh, a father tell me that after he lost his son, he wanted to kill himself, but he had two other kids, so he couldn't. Um, I've heard from people um, who uh, had tried it themselves. Um, me, St. John, uh, she was a, a boxer. Um, she had lost her son to suicide, so she was very touched by the movie um, and, and what I had to say. Um, and, and she does her own work on that subject in memory of her son. Um, it felt like, it feels like a subject that, you know, it's been so taboo. I've lost a job because of it. You know, I, I was looking to work, uh, do these weekend workshops and there was a school in Jersey that was interested in me. She looked at my website and she says, you know, I have teenagers and stuff and their parents, could I take that part down? It might turn them off. Wow. Yeah. So I said, um, no, I, this probably is not going to be a good uh, fit then. Um, probably a lot of these teenagers probably could use to know that they're not alone. But, um, you know, so I lost that, that job. Maybe I've lost other gigs, too, that I'm unaware of because of that. Um, hmm. But I, I, I don't mind. The, the most difficult thing I had to do was... Um, when I was doing the show, my son was 13 and a half and it was never a conversation I planned on having with him. You know, maybe he was 18 or older, but there's no reason to worry him or say anything. But once I knew I was doing the, the, the play and the film, I knew there's a chance he can find, he can hear about it through social media or, or some other way. So he has to hear it from me. So that was the most difficult. Um, although he handled it great and now he's in college and, just yesterday, he said, Dad, um, we're doing something on suicide in a uh, sociology class. Can I share what you're doing and your situation? I said, yeah, absolutely. So. Wow. Yeah. Well, you, you know, you definitely did it. I, I don't know. You know, I'd hug you right now <laughs> if you were here because that's. That's a very, um, like I said, and, and like you said, too, it is such a taboo subject. Right. Um, this event that you're doing uh, next week, is this related to that? or? Well, this is, it's, it starts with me trying to, uh, jumping in front of the train. All the stories that come out are, 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 are true. They all come out of my life. So originally when I wrote the play, I had 35 stories in there. And they were all really nice stories, but the play is called Out of the Darkness into the Light. So I asked, I had written an a autobiography for myself when I was 37, and that contained a lot of the dark stuff. I asked her to read it and told her that she can pull any of the stories out of there and I would answer them. So it jumped up at that point from I think 35 to 65. So, <laughs> so it's, it's balanced between the, the dark, I mean, people who knew me then wouldn't recognize me now and people who know me now wouldn't recognize me then. And I think that's, I'm not unique to that. That's, that's probably true for a lot of us, you know, we're works in progress. We're hopefully evolving and learning from our mistakes. And, um, I want to show, I want to give people hope that you can turn it around if you want to, you know, we don't have to be this. Yeah, I know from like my father's generation and, other people, I've heard people say this, well, this is the way I am. Well, you no, you don't have to be. You, you, you can change if you want to. You know, you don't, you're not stuck. You don't have to be a victim of your past. There's um, five principles um, I, I teach in my acting class. I share in my acting class because I didn't come up with them. Three came from Meisner and two came from Charlie Lawton. And they are live moment to moment to live truthfully. Don't live in the past. Those are all from Meisner. Don't attach yourself to the result and enjoy the journey. And that's from Charlie Lawton. So my holding on to the past was like destroying me. It was just a reminder of, you know, 
things my father had said to me. Once I let that go, it just freed me. So I'm not saying I have all the answers. I was asked to speak on a on a, a radio station about suicide because of the the plague, and I thought I don't know what to say. I don't know what the answer is. But then I did say that day, and I think it's true because I know I've lost six friends to suicide, and I know a lot of times people say, "Ah, I wish I would have known. I wish I would have done something." Well, I think maybe you can prevent that from happening in a lot of cases that if you know someone who's going through a breakup, lost their job, going through a difficult time in their life, don't wait for them to reach out to you. Call them. Say, hey, let's get together for coffee. Let's have lunch. You know, meet up with them. See how they're doing. Check in with them. Let them know you care. Instead of waiting until after it happens and thinking, I wish I would have done something. At least put a little bit of a break in somebody's misery and the momentum of that, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Wow. Okay. This is getting really sad. Let me do something here. Um, I didn't tell you about this before. I wasn't sure if we were going to do it, but <laughs> I don't want to depress all our listeners too much. I don't, think it's, I don't think it's depressing because, again, my play is is it's it's about hope. It's about turning that oh, around. Definitely, and and I think uh, I'm hoping. Where so it's you said it was going to be at uh, what was the address again? Yes, yeah, the Whitmore Lindley Theater, and it's um, one one zero zero six Magnolia Boulevard in North Hollywood, and the the RSVP is easy. It's just Montez Method at Gmail dot com. Great. And you you have on your website, it's the Montes, uh, method dot com, right? Am I correct? Yes. Yeah. Um, because I know you have contact information there as well. And, um, you know, just in case our listeners want to get in touch with you and want to go there and want to make sure they let you know that they're going. Yeah. Please um, reserve. Um, because originally my plan was to have the, the play um free for veterans and free for uh, people who um, were victims of suicide or yeah. touched by it in some way. And then I, I, I sat with myself and I realized that there's a lot of people suffering with depression and silence. Yeah. So um, it's, going to be, it's going to be a free event for anyone who wants to come. But, but they should RSVP to let you yeah. know. To, so yeah. I don't want you to come out there and then, you know, because it's looking like we're going to sell out all three shows. Um, so definitely RSVP. So, um, you don't come there and, uh, it's too full and you can't get in. Yeah. Well, there's a, there's a little game that I play with a lot of my guests and I call it the shout out game. It only takes 20 seconds. Would you uh, like to play this game? Sure. Okay. So, um, I'd like you to, in 20 seconds, Within 20 seconds, right? Um, and when I say go, name uh, your favorite actors. Okay? Yeah. So, ready, set, and go. Pacino, De Niro, Dustin Hoffman, Woody Allen, Meryl Streep, Hilary Swank, um, uh, Brando, Montgomery Cliff, James Dean. Uh, oh, God, I don't know what else. Um, uh, Diane Keaton. Woody Allen, uh, Charlie Chaplin. Um. Okay, time is up. But you know what? You you just named like all the most epic uh, actors in in Hollywood, <laughs> pretty much. Well, I, I, I named so a lot that that had influenced me. I mean, Sean Penn is right up there. You know, and there's plenty others. <clears throat> so. I saw when I was, I was telling you I was in one of, uh, you know, I used to take acting. I moved around in so many different schools, and one of the best ways to get in with the in crowd, right, was to go to the acting classes. <laughs> um, it helped you break in to, to the schools. And uh, I remember there was a, a play that we watched, but it was uh, filmed, and it was called uh, The Death of a Salesman, and it had Dustin Hoffman in it and our teacher made us see that and man he is one exceptional actor 
Yeah, John Malkovich was in that as well. Oh, wow. I didn't even... Oh, that's right. He played one of the sons, right? Yeah, he's Biff. Oh, wow. There's, if you can find it, the uh, making of Death of a Salesman. Uh, we see it behind the scenes, and it's just great. Wow. It's just... I mean, that's the other tool that actors have today that we didn't have. Actors, writers, directors. You can see so many interviews and hear... You know, I tell my students, you know, that want to be actors, well, who do you like? Read everything you can on them. Watch everything. What was their path? How did they get to where they are? I mean, look at Bradley Cooper, right? It's no accident he's as talented and he is where he is. You watch inside the actor studio. He was a student there, and he's questioning De Niro and Sean Penn and I think maybe Rob, Robin Williams. And you see this young, enthusiastic, passionate actor and, and, you know, look where he is now. But it, I'm sure it didn't come easy. It came through a lot of hard work and, and passion and love. Well, that's the other thing about acting that a lot of people don't realize and why, you know, like you said, um, the acting part isn't really an act. Um, I worked on a set um, with, uh, with someone who the director had her cry in every single scene, and it was... Uh, you know, I was a script supervisor at the time. And so I was there for every scene and it hurt me uh, because she wasn't acting. Every time she cried, it came from something inside of her. Yeah. So that is, uh, that's a pretty tough job. Uh, a lot of people think it's all just fun, but it's not, is it? No, you got to be physically, emotionally, spiritually fit. Um, you know, and as an actor, I want to I want to feel things deeply. I want to get as close to the situation as I can without hurting myself or hurting someone else. Um, so, yeah, I want to feel the pain deeply. I want to feel the joy deeply. I want to I want to go through what the character's going through. And that's such a big part of the story, uh, which I'm finally starting to see, you know, um, uh, for our listeners, a little thing I kind of forgot to mention in the beginning, Anthony Montes is actually the first, This is, you're the first that I'm, that I'm publicizing here, um, is going to be on the judging panel for the mobile short film competition for the International Mobile Film Festival next April. And um, I just, you know, some of the films and even in the, uh, in the feature films, um, we have a different panel for that, but uh, the acting is such a big deal. You know, the characters uh, make the story, you know? It's Absolutely. Such a, such a big part of it. And it, it's good to see more. Um, I mean, it's always good to see, you know, the quality in the films aesthetically and everything. But to me, the biggest part is the captivation. Because you were talking about, you know, uh, the movies that are done all in one location, you know? Or right. it's like one long super scene or something, right? And well, and then you're gonna you're gonna you know you're gonna cut to different angles, different yeah. things, you know, to 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 make it interesting. Of course, but you're talking about just a, a small number of actors yeah. carrying that entire film, and and the longer the film, the harder that is to do. Right. You know, so. So, um, so yeah, so thank you very much for, for, you know, now with, with boys, we've been emailing and messaging, but, um, I guess I have the opportunity to say thank you for being a judge on the, at the film festival as well. Oh, my pleasure. I look forward to seeing the films. Yeah. And so to all our listeners, you've heard it from Anthony, uh, two things. One, uh, what would you say? about mobile filmmaking to them again? Well, I would say there's no excuse not to uh, to do your passion and create. Take that phone out of your pocket, learn how to use it, and start making your films. And the second thing is to, if you can, if you happen to be in the area, or if you can go to the area, if you're close enough, go and see his show. And the dates again are December 7th. Yeah, it's Out of the Darkness into the Light, and it's December 7th and 8th at 8 o'clock, December 9th at 3 p.m. at the Whitmore Lindley Theater at 11006 
Magnolia Boulevard in North Hollywood, and you just email montezmethod at gmail.com to make a reservation. Great. Well, thank you very much for being on the SBP podcast, Anthony. Well, it was my pleasure. All right. Take care, listeners. Go make a movie.